he has uh, advised on a number of uh, um, um, platforms and um, is has a very good electrical background in terms of the standards and the regulations to do with uh, internet and cutting edge technologies. So I will hand over to Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Michael. Um, hello to everybody. Uh, hope everybody can, can hear me okay. Um, so we just go through the uh, presentation for, for, um, for tonight. Uh, so we're looking at the evolution of fire and CO detection to comply with building regulations, uh, reactive to, to preventative maintenance or management. Just a small bit of, of uh, history in relation to the uh, residential smoke detection. Um, the technical guidance document B, uh, first of all, uh, was brought in for residential smoke detection in 1997. Uh, we were under under the um, DS5 year to nine part six at that stage. Um, so in Ireland, uh, the IS 31A part nine was was brought into um, into operation on, in two thousand and nine, where we had a, sp a specific uh, section of the IS 31A standard specifically for residential premises. Uh, then in in, in uh, twenty thirteen it became part ten, and the technical guidance document. Um, B in 2017 changed uh, its reference to BS 589 Part 6 to the IS 3218 uh, Part 10 section, which is the first time it was mentioned in technical guidance document B. That's just a, a brief a brief history, I suppose, in relation to um, where the standards were coming from. In 1997, <clears throat> we just looked for the uh, smoke detection in the hallway, the landing, and a heat detector in, in, in the kitchen. Um, in the year 2006, technical guidance document B changed at that stage and we looked for LD2. And LD2, the definition of it at that stage was um, for the hallway landing, principal living room and the kitchen. So in 2017, when the review came again, uh, you can see by the, the, um, the graphic on the screen, um, we have a lot of detectors in residential premises at this stage. Um, so we'll just go through some of the definitions in relation to, to um, what we're looking at. Um, interconnection of self-contained mains power battery backup smoke and heat alarms as grade D, which is mains powered units. Um, in all circulation areas that form part of the escape route, dwelling, and in all high risk areas, um, for example, kitchens, living rooms, garages, utility rooms, and in all bedrooms. And that's a, that's a major um, advancement in, in relation to 2017 compared to 26 or 2006. I suppose one of the big reasons for the um, all all the bedrooms was the, um, the data that was that was uh, put together in relation to the uh, level of of fires that were happening in in bedrooms at that stage. Over 34 percent of fires now happen in, in in bedrooms, and that's a lot of that is down to uh, to so the equipment that's in the bedrooms, the likes of, of mobile phone chargers, um, tablets, TVs, playstations, all the kind of equipment that's in there. And uh, again, a major one and, and has a lot of uh, anecdotal feedback in relation to accidents from uh, vaping chargers. So they're, they're a quite high risk um, area now at this stage, the bedroom area. Another reason for, for it was because we're now looking for a, a higher level of, of um, sound within the bedroom itself. So the, the uh, dB level was, now we look for to be 75 dB at the better. We're moving on from there. And again, the grade D type of the, the device that, that's been looked for is mains powered with battery backup. And that can either be the PP3 back, alkaline battery backup, or it could be rechargeable lithium um, battery backup. And you see there on the graphic on the, the, the right hand side, Lithium cells are mounted on the PC board. It's a sealed uh, unit, but it can't be taken in or out for any other purpose. So if we look at the sensors um, in relation to fire detection and the way that we have progressed from, from the, the standard sensors themselves, the optical sensor, um, basically what you have in an optical sensor, you have a light, a light source um, that beams a, a beam of light to the opposite end of the chamber every 10 seconds. And then you have a light receiver that's down here in this corner, 
protected by baffles that are in the middle so that the beam originally coming down here won't get into this section here. But if you have light being or smoke being transmitted into, into the, the, the chamber itself, then you get what they call the, the light scattering principle. And eventually light will get into this um, receiver here uh, when your obscuration level becomes uh, uh, at a certain height. And under the standards, we have to manufacture uh, between uh, the obscuration level has to be between two and four percent. And we look at, at that in, right in the middle of the millet, and that's a three percent obscuration level. So that's your optical device. When that happens, when all these, these things happen, that unit goes into alarm and uh, sets off your system. The sound effect there again. Uh, the, the ionization sensor, uh, again, it's a smoke alarm or smoke uh, sensor, uh, but it's looking for a different type of smoke. The optical unit looks for the thicker black smoke. The ionization sensor looks for the uh, very, very light, small, small particles of smoke. Again, the construction of this chamber is, is a lot different than the optical, as you can see. You have a radioactive source uh, within the chamber itself, uh, and that detects the ionized, ionized particles produced by the fire. And the radioactive source then ionizes the air between the two sensing plates. And the smoke entering the chamber then attaches to the, the, the charged ions and that creates a drop in the current flow between the two plates. And this causes the unit to go into alarm. The heat sensor, uh, basically what you have in the heat sensor is, is, is a thermistor. Um, the thermistor, again, under the standards, has to react between uh, 54 and 62 degrees C, and we trigger hours of 58 degrees. So once the heat passes over the thermistor uh, at 58 degrees C, then the unit goes into alarm. I put the carbon dioxide in here with the um, with the, the smoke and the fire alarm side of it at the minute because of, of the the, uh, the sensor itself. It just go through the sensors. Carbon dioxide sensor is a lot different than the smoke detector uh, side of the business. Uh, if you look at the sensor here, this uh, section up here uh, correlates to the uh, the green one over here, and that the pinhole is the the uh, aperture for the, the carbon dioxide to get into the sensor. Underneath the the sensor cover, you have the graphite filter. And underneath all that, then you have some electrodes and separators. And you have a weak material that's down here that's that, that soaked in, in sulfuric uh, H2SO4. That's very important uh, that that maintains a certain moisture level. And that's, that'll be able to later on when we go through the location of these devices in certain positions as well. Okay, and you come down further and you see these, these gold pins and there, there's uh, uh, expensive um, elements in, in relation to the um, the elements that are used in this, uh, uh, with the gold for the, the pins itself and the platinum for the, the, the wires that go in there as well. So it's a fairly expensive uh, little sensor to, to manufacture. Again, that detects the carbon monoxide. That's the gas produced by carbon-based fuels. A chemical reaction occurs between the carbon, the, the CO gas and the sulfuric acid in the sensor. And this creates the hydrogen ions, which give a voltage and a current flow across the electrode. And the current output is, purport, output is proportional to the CO level. Um, I think I'm right in, in, in the fact that I think four microamps equates to 100 parts per million of, of carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere. So it's a very, very accurate way of measuring the level of carbon dioxide within the atmosphere itself. Again, we've, we've increased the lifespan of the, of the device when, when we started manufacturing carbon dioxide alarm, our sensors. First of all, they were five-year lifespan, then it went to seven, and now it's a 10. So anything we manufacture at this age has a 10-year lifespan. We come into the, um, the multi-sensors or dual sensors, um, and this is a step up in recent years in, in, in the manufacture of these. Uh, the first one we'll go through here is the optical and heat. There are two sensors working together to, to provide the, uh, the widest fire response. You have an optical sensor, which will trigger from smoke alone, and then we've gone through that sensor already. And, and again, with the heat, that will trigger 58 degrees C. But this is where the intelligence is built into the unit. If the heat sensor detects the, the temperature rise, then the optical sensor sensitivity automatically increases. So both sensors are constantly monitoring and, and using intelligent software to, to activate the alarm at an earlier stage. We also have what we call dust compensation built into the, the, the device. Um, some smoke alarms can give a lot of trouble over a period of time with, with uh, dust ingress into, into the units, and you can imagine a unit goes on the ceiling tomorrow and, and uh, it has to last on that ceiling with very little maintenance for the next 10 years. So it can be a bit of a, a nuisance from time to time, but, but um, in, in this, in this uh, device, we have built in 
what we call uh, dust compensation. And basically, what happens here is you have to re retain a, a certain the the, uh, the thresholds have to remain at constant. So basically, what you're looking at here is is um, those purple lines that are there. That's your your threshold. If they're not constantly maintained on a regular basis, and dust builds up here, once it gets closer to the top the top level, the unit goes into alarm. So we have stepped up the, the devices here. So if the top layer, uh, or, or sorry, if the bottom layer uh, goes closer to the top layer by by introducing dust into the chamber, the top layer then steps up, and that would happen 32 times over the life of the unit. So that's a major advance on on, on that type of technology for for the, the units themselves. Um, I just want to show you here, I suppose, the intelligence that's built into the, the unit and the way it reacts. Just it's a little video of what we've just gone through itself, and. Uh, you can see here, here in this corner is where we're going to the our fire source in this um, cubicle here. And where we're looking from is a camera angle that's looking right alongside the, the devices that are on the ceiling of this of this unit. So if I just um, roll it there, Colette, and uh, we, we'll generate a fire within this, this chamber here. You'll see it now in a second, the, the, the flame will start. But what I want you to look at is the temperature levels up here. And when you see the temperature levels rise, at a certain time, you'll see the obscuration, which is the red line down here. And that will go from, at the present, it's a 3% is where we manufacture those. But once it gets, sees a rise in temperature, it will drop from 3% to 2%. So it makes the unit a lot more sensitive. So you get a fire alert a lot earlier than you would have previously. Just to see that red line going down there. So that's the activation. You can also see that here, the temperature is at 34, 35 degrees. It will trigger 58, so it hasn't reached that yet, but your unit is going into fire because of the way the, obscu the obscuration level has worked down here earlier than would normally happen. I hope that makes sense. Okay, another unit we've devised recently is a heat CO. Uh, again, we're mixing the, the, the two different types of, of uh, sensing elements here, um, but this is designed specifically for a kitchen area where you'd have uh, a heat alarm and a carbon oxide alarm under the standards that you'd, you'd require one of each. So we combine both. Uh, there is a danger, I suppose, from uh, a certain point by combining both uh, fire side of the business and the carbon oxide side of the business. You have two different sensings, so you have two different reactions. For a fire, you seal in a room. For carbon oxide, you ventilate. So you need to know, even though it's just one unit, you need to know which element of that unit has reacted. And what we've done here is we've, we've underneath the cover, whichever element activates the system will come through in a visual. Uh, and that's important for the tenant or the, the house owner so, so that they will know which element of that device is activated. Okay. And for the carbon monoxide, we have the CO element, our, our symbol, and uh, that would come through the cover as well. Okay. For the CO side of it, you will get two different sounds from, from the, the unit itself. For the fire, you get a fire sound, and for the carbon monoxide, you get a different tone. Um, but if they're interconnected with other devices in the house, you may not know by the tone which unit has or, or which element of the of the device is activated. So that's another reason why the the, um, the visual comes through the cover. Okay, so that's the sensors, and we'll have a look now at some of the standards and regulations, uh, and bring you up to date on those. So we're covered by the uh, Power B the building regs, uh, three two one eight. The guidelines for um, rented accommodation, uh, which is uh, SI 137. And um, we have a document here from the, um, the RTB that, that was given out a very good, uh, concise document in relation to a synopsis of, of what's required for rented accommodation. And then there's fire safety in the community dwellings, which is a, a document from 2017. So, what are we looking for here? So, the system categories, the, the, we have two categories in Ireland. Uh, LD2 is our, our, our minimum standard of, of uh, level of detection within the premises itself. So LD2, again, we'll just go back over what we mentioned earlier, it's interconnect, interconnected self-contained means powered units, in circulation area to form part of the escape room within the dwelling, and in all high-risk areas, so like room, kitchens, living rooms, garages, utility rooms, and all bedrooms. So that's the minimum level of detection within the premises. The highest level of detection is, again, LD1, and that's throughout the dwelling. Again, mains with battery backup. 
including all circulation areas that form part of the escape route and all rooms and areas, including attics, lofts, and other spaces of which fire might start other than toilets, bathrooms, and shower rooms. So if you look at part B of the building regs and um, where the, 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 the whole thing comes from is, this is the paragraph that, that concerns us. A dwelling house should be so de designed and constructed, there are appropriate provisions for early warning of fire, and there are adequate means of escape in the case of fire from a dwelling to a place of safety outside the building. Okay, so we delve into, into part B and we see exactly where it's, where, where it's coming from. And it references now uh, from the 1st of July, 2017, it references IS Street to the Nate Park 10. And that serves new bills, major refurbs, and rework. So if we look at 10, 2 to 1, the minimum level of protection for a uh, uh, house up to three stories or for individual apartments, flats, or masonettes is early two. This level of protection is applicable to individual dwellings with no usual risk and with no floor area greater than 200 square meters. And we're not a single family dwelling intended to be shared by more than six persons. And what, what I mean by that is if it's a single family dwelling, there can be as, as many people that can tell people how many, how many persons you can have in a family. Um, but if it's not a single family, it's occupying the premises, it can't be shared by more than six persons. And for dwellings larger than, than 10 to the one or higher than three stories, or, and then a fire risk assessment would have to be done and a category LD1 insulation may be uh, required. There's a section in this that uh, I suppose that, that I need to bring out on this because it, it's, it's, it's very new and it's, it's not widely known as from our experience of, of giving talks uh, around this from, from uh, installers' point of view, uh, where a fire risk assessment determines that detectors are to be installed in, a, in the roof voids or attic spaces, uh, or where they're difficult to access for testing or monitoring purposes, then all the detectors with a remote control capability to allow alarm test, locate, and silence. So the introduction of a test facility in, in residential premises is brought into play at this, at this particular time. So if you're covering attic spaces or if you're in um, an area where you can't access a test button or, or a silence facility from the ground floor or from the ground, uh, then um, a control switch has to be installed on the system. Okay, the audibility of smoke and heat alarms. Audibility uh, should be such that the sound pressure level of the fire alarm system uh, measured at the doorway of each bedroom with the door open shall be 85 dB. The recommendation of 1031 applies mainly to dwellings of limited sizes and with straightforward means of escape. A higher level of sound pressure may be necessary if the occupants have a hearing impairment or any other disabilities and the provision of the visual or tactile alarm uh, signal may be necessary here. Okay, routine testing and servicing. Um, this should be carried out once a week. Um, I can't see anybody on the, the talk here, but if, if you put a hands up, everybody that, that tests their alarm every week, I don't think I see many hands up at the, uh, this stage. Uh, in, in the BS standards at the minute, they have ch changed that from every week to every month. Um, so there may, may be something that, that further down the line may come into play, but um, it's not something that's widely done unless it's, it's part of, of uh, um, Housing Association or local authority uh, plan of action. Um, there are certificates as well that can be uh, signed up for, for the, the, um, the servicing and testing of, of the, the systems. And that's there as an annex in, in the uh, Street to the Nate standard. This is always an interesting one from the point of view of, of uh, installers, and that is 10.8. It's existing multiple occupancy residential buildings. And for those type of buildings uh, where inadequate or no detection of an alarm system has been provided, subject to adequate fire risk assessment by a competent person, and subject to written communication stroke consultation with relevant uh, fire authorities, then 10 year battery operated RF interconnected units may be deployed uh, in, in those dwellings. Uh, what tends to happen and where I suppose where this came from was originally with the um, apartment blocks that were built in the boom time, um, in most of those, you probably had uh, a mains powered alarm just inside the apartment door itself and another heat alarm in the kitchen. So when the standards changed and when these, these units started to come back out of NAMA after the, the, the bust and they're coming back into the marketplace, the fire detection system within the apartments wasn't up to, to, to scratch. A lot of these buildings would have been 85, 90, 95% finished. Um, so putting 
extra wiring in these surface wiring of these with mini trunk and arm was wasn't acceptable. So this has has become the norm basically in, within within the power blocks of, of that era. Um, so you you have uh, your mains powered unit still there. Anything any mains power unit that has already already been installed in the premises has to remain a mains power unit. But off of those units, you can then um, employ the uh, ten year battery operated units that can be used with RF interconnection from there. And existing dwelling houses that are looking for firearm systems uh, within those for any existing houses built prior to the introduction of building regulations. Anything built after 97 should have at least two, a minimum of two devices within the house itself anyway. Uh, so if they were built prior to 97 and somebody's just looking for a fire alarm system to be within there, then uh, 10 year battery operated units with radio interconnection or interconnection are recommended for, for those installations. So if we look at Annex J of the, the standard itself, then the category, um, the location of the smoke and heat alarms, um, the maximum floor area covered by the, uh, the smoke and heat alarm. So you have 100 square meters for, for the smoke alarm and, and 50 square meters for the heat alarm. If we move down to the um, multi-sensor here, optical smoke alarms should be used in the living areas, circulation areas and escape routes. And that's quite different to what, what's actually practically happening out there at, at the minute. Um, I suppose because of, of the uh, price differential in ionization detectors, they tend to be used in, in most places, but the advice from the, the standards here is multi-sensor opticals should be used in the living areas, circulation areas, and escape routes, heat alarms should be used in the kitchen area, and ionization or optical then should be used in, in the bedroom. The next one is, is um, again, cause a bit, a bit of concern in, in the marketplace itself, where living room stroke kitchens are contained within uh, one single compartment. Heat alarms should protect the cooking area and a multi-sensor or optical smoke alarm should protect the living area. Okay, it's, it's, it's becoming better, um, but, but um, there are still areas where we need to, to have a look at that from, from the point of view of the install. Um, so that's just a graphic of, of what, what we've done. All the green areas are the optical units, yellow is the ionization, heat alarm in the kitchen and that's what you're looking at from, from a, a graphical point of view for the installer. Okay, if we look at rental accommodation, um, slightly different. Uh, again, there the, the, um, the RTV uh, was synopsis of, of what it looks for in, in the, the document itself. If we just have a look, each house shall contain a suitably self-contained fire detection alarm system. Each house shall contain a suitably located fire blanket. We self-contained house in a multi-unit building. So we're looking at not, not, not the apartment blocks, but what they're, they're trying to cover here is, is three or four story buildings that have been split into um, apartments, uh, old style um, inner city uh, buildings um, is, is what they're looking at here. So each self-contained house in a multi-unit building that contain a suitable fire detection alarm system, an emer emergency evacuation plan. A suitable fire detection alarm system should be provided in common areas within the multi-unit building. Emergency lights shall be provided, and fire detection alarm system uh, and emergency lights required under the regulation shall be maintained in accordance with current standard. Okay, so if we just look at a single house uh, within within either the uh, house itself or within an apartment, there should be a suitably located alarm on the ground floor hallway or room in an open plan design, and each upper floor landing of the stairwell, and each alarm. It should be the mains wired with battery backup or a 10 year self contained battery operated unit. So it gives the, the, what standards it should be up to. But I think the next section, but section four here, is probably the one that that's, uh, is of most concern to, to landlords and, and, and property management companies. It should be. Each smoke alarm should be in working order and be within its end of life indicator. So if, you've, uh, if you're a local authority with 26,500 housing stock, um, how do you make sure that? This is, this is uh, happening on a daily basis. So that's a, quite a concern for, for um, landlords and property management companies from that point of view. Okay. Um, there's not much else in it. It goes into probably on the commercial side with the L3X systems, uh, basically from there and any escape routes, again, landlord section of, of, of an apartment block or a multi-story building should be covered with um, a commercial uh, system. Again, Annex K is the model cert certificate then for the design and the installation and commissioning smoke and heat alarms for um, dwelling houses. As you can see from that, it's a one page document rather than the um, four page document on the commercial, commercial side of the business. 
So it is there, it's available. Okay, that's uh, fire detection. So we look at the standards and regulations now for, for carbon monoxide. Again, these are the documents that we're guided by in relation to, to carbon monoxide. We have part J the building regs, which is for heat producing appliances. We have the, the uh, gas standard from the NSEI, which is ISA 13. And again, we have the document for um, rented accommodation, same as we had before. So again, the 1st of September 2014 was when this document uh, came in to, to play for, for uh, carbon monoxide detection within, within premises, uh, residential premises. Reasonable provision shall be made to avoid danger to the health and safety of occupants of a dwelling caused by the release of carbon monoxide from heat producing appliances. So that's what it says in, in regulation. And if we look at Power J, um, to ensure proper combustion removal of products, blah, 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 it goes on the provision of alarm in accordance with the guidance below should be and not be regarded as a substitute for, for the maintenance. Okay, so what does it say then? 152. Where a new or replacement open fluid or fluidless combustion appliance not designed solely for cooking purposes is installed in the dwelling, a carbon monoxide alarm should be provided in the room where the appliance is located and either inside each bedroom or within five meters of any bedroom door measured along the path of the corridor. Now, this is causing a bit of concern out in the, in the, the, the market on a practical level as well because uh, there are guys going around and just installing carbon monoxide alarms in the location where the device is. That's fair enough. But the next section has to be covered as well. So it's either within each bedroom or within five meters of any bedroom door measured along the path of the corridor. And where a system chimney is being used with any uh, heat producing appliance and the flu passes within or over a habitable room, whether in case or not, then a CO alarm should be fitted in that room. Now, the definition of, of uh, a system chimney um, from, the, from the department is, is, is a, chim uh, a chimney that's assembled offsite. Manufactured offsite, sorry, and assembled on site. We're not we're not talking here about your traditional chimney breast, or chimney fireplace. We're we're talking about um, a different type, like the um, you can get block block work with the, with the, the flue inserted in the block that's put on top of, of uh, each other and, and built up that way. So that's a system chimney. It's it's manufactured offsite and assembled on site. So that's what I mean by, by those devices. Uh, again, you get them a lot on, on stoves where you have the, the, the flue going from the, uh, the top of the stove up through the, uh, I suppose, proud of the wall and up into the next room overhead. And that's what they're looking at, trying to cover here. A carbon oxide alarm then, depending on the sensing element and output, which changes in the presence of carbon oxide, it has a, a, a limited lifespan, it may become obsolete, even though the electronic circuitry remains functioning, which is why an end-of-life alarm is required. So any device on the market for carbon monoxide alarm has to have an end-of-life indicator. These are the standards that has complied with, EN50291 for the manufacturer of the unit, uh, 2010 and A1-2012. It has to be incorporated an audible and visual indicator of end-of-life. The manufacturer has to have third-party certification. So the power sources, it can be, you can have replaceable batteries, you can have 10-year batteries, you can have mains, you can have mains with battery backup. The only thing, the unit that's not allowed is a plug-in type. Okay, that's part J. If you look at A13, um, for gas installation, this is specific for gas installations. Most of, of A13 and, and part J are, are very much the same because a lot of guys, I, I suppose, the guys that were on both committees, the, 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 there was an overlap on that. But it, it looks specifically here where extended flu is a concern. And uh, if you look at, at the extended flu, within a duct or a void, inspection hatches shall be provided to permit the inspection of the flu throughout its entire length. And then a type A carbon monoxide alarm detected complying with the requirements of any size shall be installed within each duct or void and interlinked to shut down the appliance. And this is where it, it, it differs, there's a differentiation between 813 and, and power J. It's the only time in any of the standards you see interconnection of carbon monoxide alarms interlinked to a, a device to shut down the, the, um, the appliance when an alarm condition. Uh, carbon monoxide alarm complying with the requirements of any size shall be installed in every room through which a flue or duct or void passes in any room where a flue or duct void passes through the seating space. So if we look at this, this graphic here, 
Um, I suppose it, it, it really gives the whole um, story in relation to uh, what you're talking about in the extra ducting uh, and voids for gas detection. So you have the boiler on the right hand side and you have the flue going from the top of the boiler into a, a duct going across that room into the next room and out to uh, the outside wall. Okay, so we're going through two rooms in a duct. So each duct has to be uh, covered with a carbon monoxide alarm. If that was an open duct all the way through and there was no internal wall separating that, then one, one device would suffice within that duct. The fact that it's segregated, you now need a, a, a device in each segment. Okay. Those two units have to be connected to a, a relay or a device to shut down the boiler when they go into alarm. Right. Within the room itself, that duct or void passes through, a Type B device has to be uh, installed. So we have on the right-hand side in room one, you have a Type B device on the ceiling in the room where the appliance is. And in room two, you have it on the wall, a breathing level where there's no appliance. I think that sums up the, um, the 813 and the difference between 813 and, and Part A. There was amendments to, to um, ISA 813 back in, in, in 2017. Uh, only one CO detector now required when you fit a gas cooker, gas hob, or gas oven. Prior to that, you had to have one within five meters of any bedroom door, so that was, that was changed. Uh, the reasoning behind that is because they were hoping that the people that are using those appliances at that stage are alert and awake, and if anything does happen, uh, they'll be able to uh, alert other people in the premises. The plug-in type is not, detector is not permitted, and it's recommended that a CO detector be fitted where a room seal appliance is installed in the bedroom. Okay, so room seal appliances, if they were externally um, flued to the, ex or to the, the outside, uh, on an external wall, didn't require any carbon monoxide alarms in that room. But now they've seen that there are some elements of, of uh, room seal appliances that can leak from time to time. So they've said that if, if it's installed in a bedroom, it, it now requires a carbon monoxide alarm in, in the bedroom. Area. So we have uh, SI-17 or SI-137, as it's called now, the guidelines for rental accommodation. Um, it's very straightforward here. Um, in part J, it says where, where a newer replacement. In rented accommodation, it doesn't, it just goes straight in and says where open fluid or fluidless appliances, uh, where combustion air is taken from the room, for example, open fires, gas fires, wood stoves, whatever, it requires the provision of a carbon oxide alarm in that room where the appliance is located and either inside each bedroom or within five meters of any bedroom door. So it's straight in, no ifs, buts, or maybes. If it's rented accommodation, you have, uh, you have, uh, uh, Open, uh, open fires, gas fires, or wood burning stoves, you require carbon monoxide alarm. And this should be, again, installed as per manu manufacturer's instructions, which we've already done. Okay, that's carbon monoxide. Uh, audio link is a feature uh, of, of um, all our carbon monoxide alarms at this stage. Um, what, it, what it is, it, it's, it's an app that you can download from any of the app stores. Um, the what happens with the, the audio link is it's a close proximity download. It, it downloads all the historical data that has happened for the life of the unit, uh, the carbon monoxide alarm, or now some of the smoke alarms. So any, and all the historical data from the day the unit has been installed, the day, the day you want to retrieve that information can be done by simply pressing the test button on the unit three times. Um, so uh, what are the advantages? So we'll just go through that. The data can be extracted by any contractor, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet. The extraction can be done on site, no RF required, saves time to the contractor. Data can be ext uh, extracted multiple times, and the alarm status provides comprehensive data for, for records. It's a very simple process. We use um, the sounder within the device itself trans to transmit the, um, the data through sound waves, the microphone on your smartphone, and the app then converts that into a readable format. So there are your three simple steps. You press your test button three times, the download takes place onto your smartphone, and then the app transfers that, transfers that into a readable format. So basically, that's your alarm status report. So it tells you how long the unit has been installed for, uh, the battery status of the unit. We monitor for open or short circuits uh, within the sensor as well. So the sensor status is okay on, the, on that particular unit. 
Uh, peak levels of carbon dioxide. So if carbon dioxide was, was detected, it'll give you the peak levels of carbon dioxide. So it could be 4, 450 ppm, 750 ppm, depending on what's there. Uh, if you go down to the next section, there's the amount of test button activations. Now, local authorities, housing associations love this um, feature on it because there's a certain um, responsibility on the tenant or, or the, um, the uh, householder to, to uh, test the unit on a regular basis. Uh, so if, for argument's sake, if the, if the local authority tenant agreement says you must test your device every month uh, and, you, and the uh, contract come back, comes back in 12 months time, there's not 12 test activations up on that, then the, the tenant has to be notified there and for whoever uh, in relation to that. Also, if the unit has been taken off the ceiling, how many times that unit has, is, is removed off the ceiling is recorded. Okay, so that's very uh, was important information for the local authorities as well. It's why are they taking off the ceiling? Uh, if it's going to alarm, is it annoying them? Well, if it is, uh, carbon dioxide is very, very serious. Uh, as we all know, it's, it's, it's uh, an odorless taste of gas. You can't see it, smell or taste it. So there is something happening there. Um, so that, that needs to be stopped. Uh, and then we come down to the next section where you go into the uh, high, medium, low levels of activations that have occurred. And you just see there that it has, there was a um, high level of uh, twice of activations here and the last event happened 10 days ago. We go into low battery um, activations down here. So it records how many times that has happened and background levels. And I think this, this, this is the, uh, quite an important one from, from my point of view in relation to uh, background levels. We're looking for, um, 30 ppm is over a half an hour period. Here, if, if that happens, it'll clock it up. If it happens for a number of times, it'll keep clocking it up. But it gives an indication that there's some, something uh, awry with uh, some, one of the appliances in relation to a uh, leak of, of a level of carbon dioxide that shouldn't be there. It's not enough to set the, the, the uh, carbon dioxide alarms into, into activation, but it gives a big, a big indication that, that there is something wrong somewhere and, and uh, may lead to, to a further uh, alarm up along the line here. And we have seen this quite a few times where you get a lot of background levels uh, clocking up here, but then you'll see the, the activations coming into low levels or, or medium. This is the report. Again, it's just a synopsis basically of what we've, we've gone through already. Also, there's, there's a scanner within the app itself that, that uh, scans the devices, the unit, and its unique um, serial number. So it manually uh, records that, um, and, and the new button feature also scans the, the alarm uh, barcode reference number. You can also on the unit, then the app allows to input the serial number printed on the, each alarm, and this can in, uh, enter manually or by utilizing the barcode scanning, and the serial number will also uh, be reported on this. So the location within the house as well can, can be uh, put into that. It also fills the address. And that can be sent to any of the recipient, re recipients uh, that you needed to go to. So, um, you say the maintenance side of a local authority or housing association or whatever. You can also uh, download numerous um, uh, audio links from different devices in the house and generate a report just for one house itself. And that's what you get on, on the CSV report. A lot of what we've spoken about here. Um, is on a new, another new app that we have uh, as well, and that is um, an, audio, an, an alarm selector. Um, and just to go through that, it, it's an interactive app. So what, a lot of what we've done already in relation to uh, the location of devices, what type of device you need to, to put into a house is available on that app. Um, it creates a list for, for uh, multiple property installations, and it can also be emailed to, to whoever, to, to um, either a wholesaler, in relation to getting pricing for, for the devices and, and how much that's going to cost. So that's, again, there's a lot of references to standards and regulations within that app as well. So it might be no harm if you, if you wanted to download that. So wherever you get your, your, um, your apps from, whatever store, uh, it's available on that. So Google Play or, or, or the um, iOS app store. Just want to go through sort of something else, uh, some new and Invention that we have on the market, SmartLink. Um, this is going into the, the next, I suppose, next phase of, of the uh, devices and, and the way things are moving with the Internet of Things uh, further down the line for, for, from our point, point of view. 
what we have here is is a smart and gateway. Um, and the feature the features of this are the, the alarm system um, information obtained remotely. Its mains power fixed installation. It managed uh, on a top desk uh, or a, a desktop dashboard. It's a cloud based data transfer. It uses a roaming sim, and it's set up and, and commissioned by using a smartphone or a tablet. So very very from uh, easy from an installation point of view. Each of the devices within the house itself requires an RF module. Uh, that RF module then sends the information to the gateway, and the gateway sends all its information to the cloud. You can access that cloud in the, the information in the cloud on your portal, um, and that gives you an overview of your, all your housing stock. Uh, there are a lot of people looking at this at the moment um, in relation to local authority housing, uh, housing associations, and property man management companies are seriously looking at. at um, Installing these, it, what it does, we mentioned it earlier about um, SI137, where you need to know whether your unit is in good working order or whether you have, uh, it's within its end of life. And all that information is, is on your desktop, uh, just from, from one location, from what any location you move. So it's a unique protocol. Uh, each individual device has its own serial numbers, multi-level message of repeating. Uh, and uh, the trash, uh, true mesh, uh, multiple paths for the RF interconnection of each of the devices. It's the, it, that is secure communication to the cloud portal. A GSM multi network, so it's it's an open GSM card that, that goes to the strongest uh, RF or GSM signal that's that's uh, available. It's also a heartbeat from the the, the um, gateway itself every twelve hours, and it's an encrypted messages, so it's a, a secure uh, message format. The smart the in, in installation of this, this system is done by um, a smartphone. So you have your, your install of the mains powered um, and RF units, you have your gateway, you install it with your smartphone, and then you have your portal that reports all the information to you. When you're doing it with the smartphone um, device, um, your QR codes on the back of the unit, that's the way the unit talks to the other, and that's the way it gathers all the information about the, the device itself. And onto your portal. So what information can you get? With the 3000 series uh, devices, uh, we have the grade D on, on the old 160 series, which are, are obsolete now. And then you have your 10 year, 10 year battery operated units as well. So all the information can be got for those with the RF interconnection on those. And then you have your accessories feed into that as well. So the smart link, what do we, what do we, information do we gain? We gain fire alarm activation. CO, CO alarm activation, if the head was removed, you get a, a signal going to the, to, to the cloud. Button tests, units powered up. When the events have stopped, that is, act, that is recorded. A sensor fault, low battery fault, end of life, and mains absent. So if you look at all those um, messages to go out and go to the cloud, that will cover anything that, that is required from the SI137 document for rented accommodation. This is your portal, so your systems you've installed, that's the amount of gateways that have been installed, uh, six on the screen there, and 35 devices hanging off those, those uh, six screens. So you have your immediate action, so if there's an activation, will co come up here, uh, priority maintenance, and then general maintenance, which can be done at a later stage. And again, work documents or um, maintenance documents can be uh, sent to, to contractors from this device uh, to, to uh, give their list of, of, of work or job for the day or the week. So that's the message that can come through on your phone. So you can get an email or, or a text message on, on your, your phone. So the error type, the address of the property, location of the alarm, the unique serial number, the date and timestamp of the event, the model number of the device, and the description of the fault. Okay. So it's, it's increased tenant safety. It complies with, with the SI137. It's asset, asset management for management companies and, and local authorities and housing associations. You get real-time notifications, you can do reactive maintenance, and you get a risk awareness of, of tenants that are of high risk and, and that are, I suppose, abusing the system or not using the system properly. Another um, thing you want to talk about here is, is uh, recently we acquired a UK-based um, 
analytics and data company, Homelink. And we're going to the next phase of, we, we have already got our, our opticals, heat, carbon dioxide alarms and multi, multi units within the premises itself. But from here, I suppose where we're going from here is, is the houses have now been com, uh, completely sealed in. Um, we're looking at other elements of, of, of uh, dangers in a house in relation to health dangers or whatever. So we're looking at, at carbon dioxide um, or carbon dioxide detection. We're looking at humidity detection. And we're looking at a range of other stuff as well that could be linked on to, to the, uh, the, the gateway to get information to the, the likes of, of, again, local authorities, housing associations, and property management companies. Again, it's, 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 it's all going through a gateway into a cloud-based solution as, as, as well. And you have an, an extra element of, of other devices which are attached onto these. So it can, it can be um, proactive uh, repairs. So it'll give you information about something that, that, that might happen further down the line. Uh, investment efficiency, so your, your investment, how, how efficient it is and how much value you're getting for your, your, your investment. Preventative maintenance, again, coming from the likes of a boiler or something like that, to give information to say, look, uh, this needs a service so we can get it out there rather than the, the unit breaking down and then sending somebody out that, that may, and, and the whole thing may, may cost a lot more. Safety and well-being of, of the tenants themselves, reducing your, your carbon emissions, and again, compliance with IS uh, 137. So what are we looking at here? Uh, so we're, we're looking at, at, at uh, I suppose, prevention through pr prediction here. Report on, on uh, unreported problems with mold. Again, we have, uh, it's, it's a massive problem for, for local authorities. And I don't know a lot of guys uh, going around because that mold is, is, is a big, big problem. Um, you get a report from a smoke alarm that has been tampered with. Um, Highlights long-term unexpected property vacancies. Now, this this was a, happened a lot in in the, the COVID time, um, where people self-isolated, but didn't self-isolate in, in the premises they were they were living in. They went to someplace else to do it, but with a relation or something like that. And and it highlighted some of these as long-term um, vacancies because it was there for about three or four weeks without without, without any active activity within the, the premises itself. Uh, and you have uh, identify you can identify uh, homes and report thermal rating uh, for for potential investment. So these all all help in, in collection of data and, and information for for um, for the likes of, of again housing associations and, uh, and local local authorities. So the, the example platform that you would have is a kind of an ecosystem. You have a lot of stuff, and and again, I suppose from here on we're, we're, we'll have a lot of people probably convalescing in their own homes and, and doing a lot of things. Uh, in relation to, to the present day situation as well as the COVID and that. So, so you're going to have a lot of people um, staying out of hospitals, need, need some kind of care within, within their own, own home. And this can all be done through the, um, this platform. So that's what we're looking at in the future. So I think we're nearly time up. So there's nothing more important than a good, safe, secure home. And our logo, our slogan at the minute is smarter homes and safer communities. That's the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. I'm just clearing my screen. Uh... Okay, Tom, you can hear me? Yeah. Very good, excellent. Okay, there's a number of questions and what I propose to do, Tom, is that um, we'll just go straight into the questions and um, I'll just pose them and uh, then maybe you'll you'll feel free to answer them how, how you wish. So yeah. first question is just in relation to the British Standard 583 Part 6, the mm -hmm. 2019 um, uh, version of it has yeah. redefined grade D into D1 and D2 and uh, F into F1 and F2, but it, just in relation to grade D, um, are, are we likely to see that change over here in 3218 or what kind of practical implications does it have? Yeah, um, hopefully uh, it will, because I think it's, 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 it's a very good idea from the point of view of, of differentiating between the uh, replaceable battery and the recharger battery. Uh, and uh, that's fr from our perspective is, is, is vital in relation to especially specifications and things like, things like that. Yeah, it's 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 a good idea. Um, 
I know there's a review of, of 31A going on at the minute. Um, so it, it'll probably come up in that. Again, there's, a, there's other sections of it as well that I'd like to see. Uh, at the minute with IS 321A, we don't have a defined uh, grade for the 10 year battery operated units. And I, I'd like to see that happening and, and coming into play there as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question Do you see future detectors having more sensors, for example, flame or sensors for other gases? And uh, will future regulation mandate this? Is that likely? Yeah. Well, the, the, the future detection has is moving on. You see, saw from the presentation that some um, multi sensors, as we call them, but there's there's options as well. And, and I know our, our R&D department are working heavily on this in relation to other sensors being under the one cover. Uh, and the last piece I spoke about there in relation to the home link devices, very much down that side of it as well, that we, we, we will see something on that. Yeah. And you know the way uh, in the, the certain 3218 don't have individual yeah. certificate numbers. Do you think it would be a good idea that uh, there, there would be individual unique certificate numbers and that they'd actually be recorded on a database so that um, uh, interested parties could go and check to see that they there was a competent designer installer carried out Absol the works? Ab ab absolutely, yeah. Um, I, again, for, I suppose it's different different from, from the commercial side of the business where you, sometimes in, in the residential side of the business you have uh, electrical contractors designing designing um, the installs rather than uh, an architect or an, an engineer de designing the systems. Um, sometimes they're not up to speed in relation to what, what, what the standards should be. Uh, so a, a record of the installs and, and, and the, the guy, I suppose the installer and, and the designer of that would, would, be, would be vital from, from that point of view, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, technical question, what technology is AudioLink based on? Is it Z-Wave? And a slightly related question is, just how reliable or equivalent are radio-linked detector head systems with hardwired systems? Okay. Uh, the AudioLink is, is it's sound waves. So it's not Zigbee or Z-Wave or any of those technologies you're talking about, it's sound waves. And as I said in, in, in the presentation, it, it, we use the sound of this already in the device, transfer that data through sound waves. So, so that's the, the close proximity download from, from the device itself. So it's, it's sound waves that's used and, and not, not uh, Bluetooth or, or Zigbee or Z-Wave or any of those. And just, just in relation to the reliability, the diff say the, the equivalence of a radio linked system versus a hardwired linked mm -hmm. system. Can you just comment on on your view of that? Uh, it's, it's it's a common one, I suppose. It, a lot of it will depend on on the age of the person that's, that's asking the question. Um, a lot of the older people would, I suppose, when when it's it's a hardwired system, uh, prefer to see a hardwired interconnection there. Um, the RF side of the business, uh, where how we do it, we we create a mesh system within the house itself, uh, within the the, the, the system. Um, and in the commissioning stage of the RF, uh, we reduce the RF signal going out by 50%, the strength of the signal going out by 50%. Uh, so when the system is commissioned in, under that basis, and when it goes back live uh, on the system, then it's, it's, it's up to 100. So there's, there's, we're not looking at, at something being on an edge. It's, it's definitely there as a, as a connection. Now, there will always be a, an, an issue, I suppose, with, with um, change of, of physicality of a building itself. If that happens, then, then that has to be relooked at. But uh, once the system is up and running, uh, th th there isn't an issue. Yeah, I guess there, there'd be concerns on the people who are specifying systems from the designers of the building and then certifying it that there might be a reliability issue that they would feel very confident about it being hardwired together. And they might be concerned that they may not be aware of that uh, commissioning procedure that you follow of the 50% yep. reduction. And that's yep. a really good safety. Um, absolutely. It's uh, a built safety in redundancy, problem. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, very straightforward question. How do how does an occupant distinguish between a fire or a carbon monoxide activation where you've got co-located uh, detector types? Okay, um, there, are, there are different sound tones um, from, from the two different devices. Um, so that's that's probably the way of, of, of doing it. Um, now, I suppose for uh, the untrained ear, I suppose it doesn't really matter. It's the sound coming from the ceiling. Um, but it would be our, our preference, I suppose, for, for, for people just to, to whatever happens inside, whatever alarm, you, you, um, you do the, the, the relevant things in relation to whatever type of device that it is. 
And another question is just in, uh, in relation to the interoperability of different pieces of equipment from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, have you got a view in relation to that? Yeah, we'd be, we'd be very straight down the line, Michael, on, on that side of it. I mean, uh, interconnection of other devices onto other people's equipment is, is a no-no as far as we're concerned. Um, mm. Things could change from manufacturer's point of view. Different uh, voltages, different signals could be sent down the line on, 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 uh, without, without other, other manufacturers knowing what, what the, the, uh, the different voltages are. And that could create, create issues. Um, our, our motto on, on, on this would, no matter what, what devices you're doing or whose units you're using, use all the same manufacturer's devices. Mm. Um, and um, there was a change in technical guidance document B in the 2020 uh, uh, change or, or amendment to it that uh, for IS-3218 L3X systems in flats buildings, there was a provision that allowed for the detector head, which was five meters away from a be bedroom door, that that was considered in terms of TGDB to meet the requirement to provide enough sound level in the bedroom to um, make somebody aware of it. But that's for the L3X system. Um, if you want any comment in relation to that? Um. Not really, because it, uh, I suppose that there, there are different ways of trying to trying to comply with with, with that that part of the of the system itself. Um, I think really what what the, the context is the attenuation of sound levels. Yeah. And say like EI Electronics would have would have a vast experience of testing and of of scientific technical awareness of attenuation of sound and all the different issues that arise to it so mm. just if, if you could maybe limit the comment to that issue of of sound attenuation and and uh, measurement well under our standards that we work off of um the it, it's it's uh 85 db at three meters is, is what we work off of and that's the standard that, that, that our units are manufactured to uh, i so what's happening in in part B is the is for total evacuation of a, of a, of a building, um, and that is not what our units are are, are designed to do in in relation to the, that side of the building. So it it's for, that's for the total evacuation. So our units wouldn't be used for that. Yeah. Um, and a question that is there a central control panel available for LD one systems? Yeah, the control panel is, is the uh, image that I brought up earlier on. Yeah, the, the, that was the, the, the three button or the yeah, uh, yeah. three gang switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have you have your locate. Uh, what locate button does is if you have just for argument's sake, you have a system of eight units in, in, in house, one one unit activates and sets off all the other units because they're all interconnected. You press the locate button, that turns off all the units that weren't affected and just leave the one unit that activated the, the system on. So that gives you a control of your system. You're down to one unit. So you then go around and you see whether that's a, a, a smoke or a carbon dioxide, and then you decide whatever you have to do in, in those situations. If it's a fire alarm, you can silence that unit. If it's a false alarm, obviously, if it's a fire, you do what you do in a fire situation. But if it's a false alarm, you can silence that. Uh, at certain levels for carbon dioxide alarms, it won't allow you to silence it because the levels are too high and people shouldn't be in the premises at that stage. So that would keep going. Mm -hmm. And the other button then is for a test, and that gives a full functional test. It's not just testing the sounder within the unit, it does a full functional test. So it tests the electronics, it tests the, the, the sensor, it tests the batteries, and it tests obviously the, the, the sounder itself. So yeah. That's, yeah. that's a, a control system, yeah, control panel. Um, uh, yeah, your, your presentation will be getting made available to uh, engineers or members, Tom, but it'll be in a PDF format, I take it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the uh, just the last question then, because I'm conscious of the hour and and everything yeah. is just uh, are, are many fire authorities accepting radio linked fire detector alarms in existing individual apartments? Now that's not maybe a question that you yourself can uh, specifically answer, but I I think the the technology behind your system makes it very very acceptable and uh, creates a great degree of confidence. I would think, wouldn't it? Yes, and, and, and uh, our experience from dealing with local authorities and, and housing associations is being used widely in, 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 in installs for upgrading of, of, of systems within, within uh, I suppose, existing houses. 
it didn't they don't want to disrupt the, the floorboards carpets or whatever it is and if you want to extend the system from the the old ld2 uh system that we had in in, in um 97 on i suppose and, and up to the newer standards where you're covering bedrooms all that type of thing it's a very very easy install from there uh and that's that's exactly what's happening right around the country yeah Actually, there look. There's two other questions, and I'm going to ask them because they're. I think they're they raise interesting issues. Can yes. your detectors be interconnected with uh, free swing door closers? Yeah, we have a, a relay base that can be activated by the units, so it gives you a set of dry contacts that you, you can activate um, with the fire doors or swing doors or or, or uh, again as we use for, for the the uh, relay for for uh, turning off boilers in a carbon oxide situation. And uh, finally there, the uh, question just, we don't have a lot of basements in this country, but in the US, carbon monoxide uh, fatalities are very common because boilers are, are located there. And if there's a fault condition, carbon monoxide can fill a basement for it fills the ground floor. Do you want to just comment in relation to locating carbon monoxide detectors on, on ceilings and basements or where they, they, they should be located? Yeah, well, the standard that we work off of in, in here is EN50292, which is for the installation of carbon monoxide alarms in residential premises. And it's very specific in, in relation to, to the location of the devices. If it's in a room where the appliance is, it should be located on the ceiling one to three meters away from the appliance. It can be, it can be mounted on the wall. If, it's going, if, if you want to mount it on the wall, it should be as high as possible, but at least 150 mil down from the ceiling. But again, one to three meters away from the appliance. If it's in an area where there's no appliance, like a hallway or a landing or, or, or a bedroom that might not have an appliance, then it's a breathing level on the wall. So if you're in a hallway or a landing, then it's a, it's a standing level on the wall. If you're in a bedroom, it's a bed height. If you're in a sitting room with no appliance, it's a sitting level. And they're, they're, they're the, the general guidelines in, in EN50292. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It, it, it does it does create a bit of a, a talking point in most of the, the uh, training sessions or, or, or talks that we give because there's a lot of i suppose misinformation again coming from some of our competitors will be american-based uh, companies mm. going back to what exactly what you said about about the, the way they, their heating systems are are, are, are uh, installed in houses the boiler will be in the basement and that, that type of so their diagrams their 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 information might be slightly different than what, what they're looking at in the end five or 292. Yeah, but e e electronics are all over the world. Like you're based in Limerick. There's yeah. over a thousand employees in the company. Nine hundred of them are based in Limerick, in in uh, on the Shannon area. You you, yeah. you export all over the world. Yeah. Um, you're a, an indigenous Irish based uh, company. You're around for forty odd years. It nearly fifty six. Nearly this age, I don't know. Is it? Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, yes, it's like, nineteen sixty three. Yeah. Like tonight, um, it, the the presentation is is being co uh, um, sponsored with the uh, the Thomond Regions Committee, and I can say that um, the Thomond Region are are particularly proud of the fact that you're a, a Thomond based company. And um, now the chairperson Pat Donnellan wasn't able to be here tonight because he's got business and he's he's online um, uh, doing his own work. Otherwise, he he'd actually be here, but he just wanted to. Uh, pass on his best wishes to you and um just to just to reiterate that um we're delighted in the fire and safety division to to have had you as as a speaker with us here and um going given from the number of questions we've had tom i think the the audience have found it to be a, a really really interesting uh presentation and the content to be very very uh topical and and very informative i must admit as well which is which is excellent um and um and and i i, I think um uh, just from from the fire and safety division's point of view we'll just uh, formally just thank you tom and uh, wish you the very best in the future